In this video, I want to share with you some rather interesting information about the Dead Sea Scrolls and what they tell us about the Hebrew text of the Bible. Now, what the Jews call the Hebrew Bible or the Tanakh um, is in Hebrew originally. Obviously, it's been translated. Bits of it are in Aramaic, but basically in Hebrew. And I want to t uh, talk to you about the manuscripts, how old they are. What is our oldest Hebrew Bible that we have? quite a surprising answer to that but I want to look at the Dead Sea Scrolls particularly and there's some good news about them and some not so good news about them and I want to kind of share this story with you and I'm going to be relying on this marvellous book here we are it's called the Bible a historical and literary introduction second edition by Bar Ehrman of course who's been on blogging theology um, this is published by Oxford University Press very readable very popular introduction to the Bible I do highly recommend it, although it's not very cheap, but it's uh, worth investing if you are a serious student of the Bible. So I um, want to share these words, as I say, from Bar Ehrman. And before we get to the Dead Sea Scrolls, he talks a little bit about the manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible, because today we have printed copies, but they weren't always printed. Sometimes they're written by hand. So how old are these manuscripts and do they go back to the beginning when they were originally written or not? before we get to the Dead Sea Scrolls. And there's a really interesting piece of information there about them. And there's some ideas that many people, <clears throat> excuse me, particularly Christians have about them, which are, are basically uh, you know, misunderstandings or not based on fact. So Bart Ehrman says on page 100, uh, 402 about the manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible. The first printed copy of the Hebrew Bible, that is from a printing press, appeared in 1488. Before then, for over 2,000 years, the Bible had been produced and reproduced by hand in manuscript form. The printers of the 15th century, and later, of course, had to decide what to print. And for that, they had to use manuscripts that were available to them. And these days, by the way, we have much better and older manuscripts than they had. If what they used were manuscripts with lots of mistakes in them, then necessarily the printed version of the Bible, now in many multiple copies, would reproduce the mistakes made by the scribes who had centuries earlier copied the text by hand. Now, today, there are millions of printed copies of the Bible in Hebrew and in many modern translations, of course, all produced by modern means. But what manuscripts are these printings based on? How good are they? How old are they? And this is really very surprising, I think. If you don't know this, it's quite a shock. What do you think, by the way, is, is a question for you. What do you think is our oldest complete manuscript of the Hebrew Bible? How old is it, do you think? So remember that Moses lived probably two, two and a half thousand years BC or BCE. Um, and if the Torah was revealed to him, uh, as, as we all believe. So how old are the manuscripts of the Torah that we have? So now you've perhaps got an answer. Here are the facts. The oldest complete manuscript of the Hebrew Bible that we have, which is the basis for modern printings of the Bible, is, co is called the Leningrad Codex. That's because it's located in Leningrad in Russia. It dates from about the year 1000 CE or 1000 AD, i.e. about a thousand years ago. So that's our oldest one, a thousand years ago. We do not have any complete manuscripts of the Bible before this. Isn't that startling? We have nothing from the time of Jesus, nothing from before the time, the time of the prophets, the time of Moses, not for the first thousand years. We don't have any complete Bibles. Only 1000 AD do we have a complete Bible of the Hebrew Bible. That means, by Ehrman says, that the oldest complete manuscript is 1700 years after the earliest books of the Bible had been written and 900 years after <clears throat> the canon was closed. The canon is the list of books that were accepted as part of the Bible. Now, there was a somewhat earlier Hebrew manuscript called the Codex Aleppo, but it's not complete. 
um, and a lot of it was destroyed in 1948. Earlier, relatively complete manuscripts simply do not exist. And what's the reason? And the interesting, there's actually a really good reason why we don't have early copies of the Hebrew Bible. It appears that in the Middle Ages, when Jewish scribes copied the Hebrew Bible by hand, because they had to, there was no printing, they destroyed the manuscripts they used to make their copies once their own copies were complete. So they copied the Bible from the older manuscript and they simply destroyed the older copy. So the older copies they copied do not survive. And that's deliberate. It's not just, oh, well, we might dig them up. They actually destroyed them deliberately. Now, our understanding of the text of the Hebrew Bible changed radically with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, as we will see. But not even among the Dead Sea Scrolls did we find complete manuscripts of the entire Bible. No. And so the key question is, should we be concerned that the Jewish scripture or the Old Testament, as Christians call it, we read today, are based on manuscript that was copied from earlier manuscripts, copied from earlier manuscripts for many, many centuries. Is this an issue that we should be concerned about? As I say, the first surviving complete manuscript of the Bible was, was made fully 17 centuries after some of the books of scripture were written. And of course, just as a quick footnote here, we compare that with the Quran, for example, we now have actual manuscripts, physical copies of the Quran going back to the time of the prophet Muhammad himself, upon whom be pieces. The famous is a copy in the University of Birmingham. I interviewed the, uh, the professor in charge of that department on blogging theology, who's actually a Christian. And he confirmed that the early, we do have copies of the Quran <clears throat> that go back to the time of the prophet himself. And of course, it was usually uh, transmitted orally, actually, by literally hundreds of thousands, not millions of people. We do have a physical copy. This is the same as our copy today. Anyway, but back to the Bible. Now, there was an older view that scholars used to have about this matter, the Hebrew Bible and the dating, and it's still quite common amongst Christians. You might hear this at Speaker's Corner. You might hear this on YouTube from some Christians. And the older view was that there's no reason to be concerned because Jewish scribes from time immemorial, forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, followed very strict rules when copying their texts to make sure that they never changed a verse or even a word or even a letter. Jewish scribes were known to be highly scrupulous so that the text known in the year 1000 AD or CE, it was believed, was the same as the text known in the year 1 or the year 1000 BC or way before that, the time of the prophets. Scholars today, says Professor Bart Ehrman, are not quite as sanguine about the matter for lots of different reasons. It's true that in the Middle Ages, Jewish scribes adopted a set of rules to ensure that they would not change the text. So they were very careful in the Middle Ages. But when did those rules come to be put in place? This is the question. Were Jewish scribes always like that, like they were in the Middle Ages, like a thousand years before that? Bar Ehrman says these rules were certainly not in place in the years after Isaiah of Jerusalem produced his book. Now, Isaiah of Jerusalem was around about the 8th century BC, 800 years before Christ. These rules didn't exist then, or even in the centuries immediately after that. So if what the texts of the Hebrew Bible, so what if, Bar Ehrman asks, the texts of the Hebrew Bible were changed even a little or a lot in the centuries before these rules came to be put in place? To deal with this question, we need to consider a bit of background, which we'll now go into. So he raises the important point. Yes, in the medieval period, the Jews were very concerned with a meticulous, scrupulous preservation of the text. Absolutely. But we cannot and must not assume that the Jewish scribes always did that. And in fact, there is no evidence they did that at all. 
in the many, many centuries or a couple of thousand years before that. This was a medieval practice. And this is this is a new thing that scholars now understand and accept. A lot of the older scholars, of course, didn't know that. And many um, lay people still don't know that this is the case. So if just a few words before we come on to the final part, which is, of course, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is very, very interesting. It tells us some very important information about whether or not the Bible we have today is basically reliable or not. This is a really important question. You're very rarely heard here discussed by uh, Christians in an informed and scholarly way. They would just have perhaps very outdated ideas about, of course, it's reliable. Well, let's hear what the experts say now. What is the consensus of historians, textual critics today in the modern times? So before we get to that in a minute, uh, a few words about the Masoretic text, Masoretic text. The text of the Hebrew Bible that's read today, and that is and that is the basis of all modern translations, is called the Masoretic text. It is called this because Jewish scholars who devise the rules for copying scripture are known as the Masoretes. The Masoretes. The term Masorete comes from the Hebrew word Masora, which means tradition. The Masoretes were the scholars who worked out ways to preserve the traditions of the Hebrew Bible. And they were active between about 500 to 1000 AD. So 500 to 1000 years AD. So this is long, 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 long after the time of Isaiah, Abraham, Moses and the prophets, peace be upon him, many, 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 many centuries before. To understand what the Masoretes accomplished, you need to remember that ancient written Hebrew was a language that used only consonants, not vowels. Now, of course, Muslims will know that Arabic is the same. It's a very similar language. Arabic, Ar Aramaic, Hebrew are all cognate languages. Any language that is written only in consonants is open, obviously, to serious problems of interpretation. Imagine if you were to write English that way. Apart from context, apart from any context, you would have no way of knowing whether the word M-N-R, M-N-R, was, without vowels, minor or manner or mona or manure. It could have been, it could be any of those words. You don't have the vowels, the A-E-I-O-U letters. So over the centuries of their work, the Masoretes accomplished several gargantuan tasks. For one thing, they standardized the entire consonantal text of the entire Hebrew Bible so that there was an agreed on text with no variations. This is the Masoretes did this. They produced this agreed upon text. In addition, they devised a system of dots to be added to all the consonants to indicate the appropriate vowels so that anyone reading the text would know which of a range of possible words was to be accepted as the right one. I'd be interested to know, by the way, if these Jewish scribes basically borrowed the Islamic uh, um, developing understanding of adding dots, uh, vowels to the consonantal text of the, the skeletal text of the Quran. I wonder if they actually got that idea for Muslims. And they, they worked to make sure that no one would ever change the text again by implementing rules to be followed in the copying of the text. All of this labor had a tremendous and long lasting result. And this is why it matters so much because we have these Bibles today. The Masoretes standardized the text. Moreover, scholars today are reasonably certain that when the Masoretes started their work, they were dealing with a consonantal text, just the consonants, no vowels, that was already well established, that changes had not been made, at least significant ones, for centuries, since at least the end of the first century AD. So we can, for the most part, rest relatively assured that the Hebrew text we read now, assuming we can read Hebrew, I certainly can't, is the same text that was in place 1,900 years ago. The question is this, what 
about before that? What about before that date? Can we be sure we have the same text before then? And this is where we finally come to the evidence of the Dead Sea Scrolls and why what they disclose is so important for very, very important reasons. Now, there are many reasons that the Dead Sea Scrolls have proved so important for, scholar, for scholars of ancient Judaism, Bartleman writes. One of these reasons has to do with the text of the Hebrew Bible. As I pointed out, says Bart Ehrman, over 200 of the scrolls contain texts of the Hebrew Bible. The most famous is a complete copy of the book of Isaiah. It's on display. You can see it's a fantastic scroll, perfectly preserved. Most of the texts, however, most of the Bible books, however, are not complete. They are fragmentary. And some are just scraps. So Isaiah is an exception, not the rule. Still, their importance cannot be understated. Remember, the, Ma the Masoretic text that printed Hebrew Bibles are based on is that of the Leningrad Codex from just a thousand years ago. The texts of the Hebrew Bible among the Dead Sea Scroll are at least a thousand years earlier than that. Wow. So we've got, we can jump now from a thousand AD right back to about, well, the year one, I suppose. By comparing the form of the text in the scrolls with the manuscripts from around the year a thousand, we can see how well the text had been copied over all those intervening centuries. So we can test now how well these manuscripts have been preserved. Now, there's some very good news, says Bart Ehrman, and some not so good news, says Bart Ehrman. So there's good news and bad news becoming, coming from our discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. What's the good news? Well, the good news is this. In many instances, the Hebrew text found among the Dead Sea Scrolls is very, very similar to the consonantal text standardized later by the Masoretes. The copy of Isaiah, for example, this whole complete copy, is very much like the copy found in the Leningrad Codex. So that's good news. The Bible has been faithfully preserved in that example when it comes to the book of Isaiah. The not so good news is that this is not the case with all the books of the Hebrew Bible, most of the others. Scott, and this is where it gets a bit detailed, but we've got to, the devil's in the detail here to appreciate what's changed, what hasn't remained reliably transmitted, what has been, the devil's in the detail. So the bad news is scholars have long noted, for example, that the Greek translation of the Bible called the Septuagint, this is the, the New Testament, when it quotes from the Old Testament, only ever quotes from the Greek translation, not from the Hebrew. So scholars have long noticed that the Septuagint Greek text of the book of Jeremiah, for example, was about 15% shorter than the Masoretic text, i.e. it had that many fewer verses or words. And scholars had suspected that it was because the Hebrew version of Jeremiah was known to the ancient Greek translators was significantly different from the Masoretic text. So we have different versions of same books. As it turns out, one of the scrolls discovered at Qumran, this is where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, has a Hebrew text of Jeremiah that is closer to, the, to that lying behind the Septuagint version than the Masoretic text. 15% is a big difference. Other books of the Greek Bible, the Septuagint, are also strikingly different from the Masoretic text. For example, the books of Samuel and Kings. It's possible that the Hebrew text of all these books were in a serious flux before the text came to be standardized by the end of the first century. It's possible the Hebrew texts were very, very different, huge variants between them before the much later standardization 
And what about the times before the scrolls from Qumran were produced? So what do we know about before the Dead Sea Scrolls? How much was the text in flux? Was it changed radically in the early centuries when it was copied by hand time and time again among scribes who did not have and so could not follow the rules later laid down by the Masoretes? What about then? And Bart Ehrman concludes this set the statement. And I think this is really, this is in a sense the, 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 the conclusion of this brief video. The reality is that we simply do not know how much the text got changed in what places and for what reasons in the early centuries of copying. We have no way of checking. We just don't know. We don't have the evidence, but we can't assume like the older view of scholars, that the Masoretic rules of preservation and scrupulousness were in place. They weren't. That's a much, much later development. And so the story is this, says Bar Ehrman, for many, many centuries, the text of the Hebrew Bible has not changed in any significant way, but we cannot tell how it was altered between the time the books of the Bible were produced these are the originals, the autographs, if you like, and the time their texts came to be standardized near the end of the first century CE. We just don't know. So that's the conclusion of what I'm going to share with you. I've been reading uh, from the Bible Bart, uh, by Bart Ehrman. Do recommend it. It's not cheap, as I say. But this uncertainty um, in the biblical text is actually quite important. It's not widely known. Popularly, people think the Dead Sea Scrolls just confirm the Bibles, the text we have. Actually, it's not true. In some instances, yes, the book of Isaiah, but in other instances, in many of the other books, it's not the case. And we see differences, sometimes big differences, like 15 percent of Jeremiah. Uh, that's the difference between our Masoretic text. Modern translations are based on that and what we find uh, in the ancient manuscripts in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So you see, it's actually quite, there's a lot of doubt and uncertainty um, about the Hebrew text going right back to the earliest years, the time of their being written. We don't have the autographs. We don't have the originals. And there's a huge transmission period from the earliest times. Uh, centuries later, we have no idea what's happened at all. We can't check if they've been reliably transmitted. And again, just a quick footnote, footnote about the Quran. We have now increasing numbers of Quranic manuscripts go right back to the beginning, the time of the Sahaba, the time of the Prophet, be upon him, be peace. And we're now pretty much certain that the Quran we have today is the same Quran that was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, upon whom be peace. And we know that both in terms of the mass transmission, the Mutawata transmission uh, orally, and manuscript forms as well. Uh, but the story for the Bible is actually quite different, um, but uh, as, as we have seen. So I just wanted to share those, uh, the good news and the not so good news uh, about the Dead Sea Scrolls. I hope that was of interest. Till next time.